in this video we are going to talk about the common rock forming minerals and their physical and chemical properties these are our learning outcomes sir i was not ready for that so what is a mineral a mineral is a naturally occurring not man-made or machine generated inorganic not a byproduct of living things solid with an orderly crystalline structure and a definite chemical composition all of these should be present in a substance or in an object for it to be considered as a mineral so minerals are basically the basic building blocks of rocks so when asked do you consider water a mineral the answer is no because it is not solid and it is not crystalline how about a tube ice ice or tube ice is not a mineral because it is not naturally occurring but a snowflake possesses all the properties under the definition of a mineral so a snowflake is a mineral another example of a mineral is halite or table salt so this table shows properties of the mineral halite it is composed of sodium and chlorine, hence the NaCl symbol, which is read as sodium chloride. Here we have luster. Halite has a non-metallic vitreous luster. A luster is a quality and intensity of reflected light exhibited by the mineral. And we have two kinds. We have the metallic luster and the non-metallic luster. Metallic is generally opaque and exhibit a resplendent shine similar to a polished metal. A non-metallic could be vitreous, meaning glassy, adamantine, brilliant or diamond-like, resinous, silky, pearly, dull, greasy, among others. Next, we have hardness. So, halite is soft. And we have a number 2 to 2.5. What does it mean? So hardness is basically the measure of the resistance of a mineral, not specifically surface to abrasion. Test the hardness of minerals, a scale designed by a German geologist slash mineralogist Friedrich Moss is used. This is what he called the Moss scale of hardness. The Moss scale of hardness measures the scratch resistance of various minerals from a scale of 1 to 10 based on the ability of a harder material or mineral to scratch a softer one. Okay? And the scale looks like this. So you have 1, 2, 2.5, 3, etc. until 10. On the third column, you can also see the household item equivalent to the hardness. For example, 2.5, it is a fingernail. So what are the pros of using the Moss scale? First, the test is easy. Second, the test can be done anywhere, anytime, as long as there is sufficient light to see scratches. And third, it is convenient for field geologists with sketch kits who want to make a rough identification of minerals outside the lab. What are the cons? First, the scale is qualitative, not quantitative. Okay? So we can't make numbers. And second, the test cannot be used to accurately test the hardness of industrial materials. Next, we have color and streak, which are both white for halite. Color is the easiest physical property to describe. However, it can also be the most difficult to make a mineral identification. A lot of minerals can exhibit same or similar colors. For example, we have calcite and quartz. As you can see, they are almost the same. Now, individual minerals can also display a variety of colors resulting from impurities and also from geologic processes like weathering. One example is amethyst, which is purple in color. Streak, on the other hand, is the mineral's color in powdered form. It is inherent in almost every mineral and is a more diagnostic property compared to color. Note that the color of a mineral can be different from its streak. So one example is pyrite, FES2. This exhibits gold color 
but has a black or dark gray streak. My two brain cells are really not up to par. Next, we have the crystal form and crystal habit. Crystal habit is the tendency for specimens of a mineral to repeatedly grow into characteristic shapes. So these shapes are influenced by the atomic structure of the mineral. But they can also be influenced by the environment of crystal growth. Crystal habit is an external shape displayed by an individual crystal, but more often it is an external shape displayed by an aggregate of crystals. Examples include prismatic, tabular, and bladed. So a mineral that do not have a crystal structure is described as amorphous. Now, crystal form is a concept similar to crystal habit. It is a solid crystalline object that is bounded by a set of flat faces that are related to one another by symmetry. Euhedral crystals are the best representations of crystal form. Next, we have cleavage. So the cleavage of a halite is a perfect cubic. Cleavage is the property of some minerals to break along specific planes of weakness to form smooth, flat surfaces. So these weak planes exist because the bonding of atoms making up the mineral happens to be weak in those areas. So when minerals break evenly in more than one direction, cleavage is described by the number of cleavage directions, the angle or angles at which they meet, and the quality of cleavage. For example, we have this. Cleavage in three directions at 90 degrees or cleavage in three directions not at 90 degrees. Just remember, cleavage is different from habit. So the two are distinct, unrelated properties. Although both are dictated by crystal structure, crystal habit forms as the mineral is growing, relying on how the individual atoms in the structure come together. Cleavage, meanwhile, is the weak plane that develops after the crystal is formed. Next, we have the specific gravity. The specific gravity is the ratio of the density of the mineral and the density of water. So this parameter indicates how many times more the mineral weighs compared to an equal amount of water, which has a specific gravity of 1. For example, a bucket of silver has a specific gravity of 10 would weigh 10 times more than a bucket of water. Now, other properties include magnetism, odor, taste, tenacity, reaction to acid, and etc. For example, is magnetite. This is a strongly magnetic mineral. We also have sulfur, which has a very distinctive smell. It's like a rotten egg smell. And halite, of course, table salt, is salty. Now, minerals, like any other things, can be categorized. The most stable and least ambiguous basis for classification of minerals is based on their chemical compositions. This slide shows some minerals and their native compositions. First, we have silicate. Silicates are minerals containing the two most abundant elements in the Earth's crust, namely silicon and oxygen. So when linked together, these two elements form silicon oxygen tetrahedron, which is the fundamental building block of silicate minerals. So over 90% of rock-forming minerals belong to this group. We also have the oxides. So these are minerals composed of oxygen and ion combined with one or more metal ions. Next, we have sulfates. Sulfates are mineral containing sulfur and oxygen in the form of SO4 minus an ion. We also have sulfites. Sulfites are minerals containing sulfur and a metal. So some sulfites are sources of economically important metals such as copper and lead. Next, we have the carbonates, which are minerals containing the carbonate CO3 2 minus an ion combined with other elements. And of course, we have the native elements. These are minerals that form as individual elements, such as gold, diamond, bismuth. And we have three kinds. 
first are the metals and intermetals. These are minerals with high thermal and electrical conductivity, typically with metallic luster and low hardness, such as gold and lead. Next, we have the semi-metals, which are minerals that are more fragile than metals and have lower conductivity. Some examples include arsenic and bismuth. And lastly, we have the non-metals. They are non-conductive, such as sulfur and diamond. Last, we have the halides. So halides are minerals containing halogen elements combined with one or more metals. Now, for example, we have dolomite. Dolomite is a form of limestone rich in approximately equal parts of magnesium carbonate and calcium carbonate. So the element there is calcium and magnesium. Plus the native element, of course, carbonate, which is really beautiful, he said. So the elements listed here comprise the 99% of minerals making up the Earth's crust. Okay, So this one shows you the important rock-forming minerals and their primary occurrence. Now pause this video and take a screenshot for your reference. Just remember, rock-forming minerals make up large masses of rocks, such as igneous, sedimentary, or metamorphic rocks. Rock-forming minerals are essential for the classification of rocks, whereas accessory minerals can be ignored in this endeavor. So almost 85% of the atoms in the Earth's crust are oxygen and silicon. Therefore, the most common and abundant rock-forming minerals are silicates. Some common carbonates are also abundant. 